Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Hopefully you had a, a pleasant lunch, breakfast, brunch, as the case may be. And um, I, I do apologize. Um, I uh, am a, a fair, fairly new person to the mural uh, application, and I was unable to figure out um, a way to do what I wanted to do and not make you sign in log in yet another time to this individual sheet, but I could not figure out a way around that. And so I beg your indulgence and ask you to go on to the chat where I have just uh, one minute ago put the link that will give you access to the uh, collaboration opportunities um, chat page or, or um, collaboration space on Mural. And um, uh, I think this is a very rich topic, especially based on what we heard over the last three days. And therefore, um, I hope uh, many or all of you will uh, will jump in there and, and put some ideas, uh, collaboration ideas uh, on the uh, on the, the, the space. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to my partner. <coughs> Uh, Bill Bauman, who's going to run this uh, session and uh, let him get going on it. Thanks, Matt. And if I can, I'd like to share my screen. Do it here. There we go. So we're talking about collaboration in this session. So please, um, any uh, topics on collaboration, you can enter into the tool as Matt has put up in, in the URL. But um, while we we're getting there, I just wanted to show this one slide. And this is something that if you've seen our weather community of interest presentation before that we typically use, and many organizations have the same issue and it's a challenge for weather. So um, on the, the bottom of this, you can see in smaller print, it says straight from Steve, big data and safety, February 27, 2020. That was from our administrator, Steve Dixon, where he was talking about silos of excellence within the FAA and how to break them down through sharing of information. And these silos represent different organizations within the FAA that either research, produce, or use weather in some way, shape, or form but of course they don't necessarily collaborate with each other unless there's some efficient way to do that. And hence we started our community <laughs> of interest to connect all these silos and have people working together on them instead of uh, working in their own world. So you have that within an organization, but what about within the federal government? Well, hopefully ICAMS, uh, the former OFCM, will help mitigate that with the new structure that it has with uh, 15 federal agencies participating and, and hopefully working together in the different committees and subcommittees, but then extend that to uh, public-private partnership. How do we collaborate between federal and, and state agencies and private industry? Uh, there are silos there and different barriers. And uh, I think in this session we're looking for possible ways uh, to break those down, looking for suggestions from folks on how we can better collaborate either across the federal enterprise or um, through public-private partnerships. So I will leave it there. And I think I just unshared, did I? And Matt, can you put up the um, murals for this session, please? Can you share that? Great, thank you. I can't read that. I will need to also open up the URL. There we go, okay. So this one says, says based on Dan, Lindsay's comments yesterday, it sounds like there's a great opportunity for the FAA and NESDIS to collaborate on advanced aviation specific satellite products. Would anybody like to comment on that? 
and I actually missed that session. Well, uh, um, I'll comment. Go, okay. Randy. Go ahead. Um, yes, it is a great opportunity, and we're actually um, trying to set up more collaboration with them. Uh, as, as I kind of mentioned in the chat yesterday, um, yes, it's easy for us to go and, and talk to them and say, hey, this would be great if we could do this. Um, but, you know, they're they're you know, they need funding just like everybody else. And we're actually trying to put a contract in place to uh, potentially do some of those things. We were hoping to do it last year, but uh, we had some funding issues on our side that kind of prevented that. But uh, yes, we are working with on that. Um, in the past, in the last couple of years, we've had a, uh, a satellite Tim where where we invited a, a bunch of uh, folks from different groups to to uh, uh, come and speak and, and uh, pr present. And so we know that there's a lot of great things that uh, NESDIS is doing. Uh, CIRA, SIMS, you know, the folks at uh, uh, Wisconsin Madison and Colorado State and others are doing. So uh, we're, we're trying to do that. Um, um, and it ex even extends beyond that, uh, you know, talking with NASA Sport on uh, on some of the things that they're doing with lightning data. So um, that was kind of the, you know, one of the purposes of this, Tim, was to, uh, you know, see what's out there and see who else we need to be talking to that we're not right now. Um, DOE is a perfect uh, uh, example. You know, I didn't know all the things that they were doing, and I certainly didn't know that they had an aircraft that we could potentially use for flight campaigns. So, um, you know, that was, again, that's the purpose of this, one of the purposes of this meeting and uh, uh, something that we can, we will certainly build upon as we go forward. All right, thanks, Randy. Good info, uh, Curtis, you got your hand up. Curtis, did you have a comment? Maybe not. He took his hand. <laughs> well, uh, so Randy, that that was uh, that was my it's my comment on the uh, on the brainstorm page right now, and and um, I was I was um, again I was struck by some of the speakers at that at that time comments about you know, well, if we just have conversation, we could, you know, we could probably just do some of this stuff. <laughs> it almost sounded like it was a, it was a, a plea to, to, to give us some intel and some information and, 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 you know, help us understand what the problem space is and, and don't worry about the funding. We, we, we want to do this stuff. So uh, that, that's why I never quite heard it expressed that way. And, and that's what struck me so much about it. And and we even work with, uh, um, you know, Jeff Weinrich is from NASDAQ and um, or was before he moved, and uh, he was holding monthly meetings where they were sh they were sharing some of their uh, satellite uh, data or uh, initiatives, and uh, so we've been a part of that. So it's 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 a growing relationship. We'll just put it that way. Good. I try to make that bigger, Matt. Um, that's an example of, uh, I guess, a private, uh, public-private partnership in in a sense. So in FAA, we've developed a uh, input or an intake for um, suggestions or problem statements. So we call it the Aviation Weather Request Form, and I added the URL there so that, and, and we've been talking about this for a couple of years. And that uh, link is live and active, and it's a form that uh, any stakeholder that operates in the NAS can fill out with problem statements or suggestions for things to improve the NAS. And that's one way we could collaborate with private industry uh, within the FAA in a public-private partnership. And uh, that was a thought that we had several years ago. It was actually thanks to Tammy Flo and the Turbulence Workshop where we had um, some pilots and some of the uh, private industry Mets asking us questions about how can we get support from the FAA and request things. And we did that through this portal. 
where anybody can, as I said, submit on the form and um, our uh, policy and requirements branch will assess what's in there and it's possible it could become a validated requirement that we would work on in collaboration with the submitter. And I think we've had eight or 10 of them submitted in the last year or so. And um, that's open to anybody. So keep that URL handy and uh, submit if you'd like to collaborate with the FAA on things going on in the NAS that you'd like us to look at. Uh, I see a couple of new ones coming in here. I heard PK expresses interest in linking NASA's ATM lab to the AWC lab. MITRE has a nicely equipped ATM lab called Idea Lab. Is that you, Matt? Bill, we also have a couple of questions in the in the chat from Matthias. To what what extent can people listen or participate in aviation stakeholder forums? Matthias, can you be a little more specific on aviation stakeholder forums? Obviously, this is one. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I was thinking in terms of like you know there is airlines getting together and discuss certain issues they have that may be related to weather, or it could be airports that get together and chat. And to what extent are those forums public that somebody else is a aware of that they exist and happen and be able to at least listen in because that will be a way to better appreciate what the needs are and learn about those things, which may then feed into you know, opportunities of uh, weather guidance development and collaboration and testing and things like that. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if uh, there's anybody uh, that's on our panel that could answer that or any of the folks. I know, for example, ICAMS is uh, federal employees only, so that's a, a closed forum. Uh, the weather community of interest is FAA only in general but we did receive permission uh, for our federal partners to participate as a subject matter expert, but uh, by definition of community of interest within the FAA is supposed to be for FAA employees only to break down those silos that I displayed on the first slide. Um, we do meet, when I say we, FAA and National Weather Service, periodically with A4A through their meteorology meeting so that's, I guess, semi-public, private, but not open to everybody. So um, aside from something like an AMS and ARAM, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that might fit that, Matthias. Anybody else want to chime in on this one? May I see your comment, Randy, about AOPA, ALPA, A4A, NATCA, et cetera, uh, attending FPAL, but they do need to know about it. So communication is key. Hey, hey, Bill, this is Dave Kochevar in uh, Weather Service Alaska. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Hey, I, I can kind of help answer this more from a, I guess, a regional and local perspective. Um, you know, we, we routinely, you know, in the in the pre-COVID world, we, we routinely hosted workshops um, with the local community, with the local operators that would include Weather Service, FAA, military, you know, 121, 135 operators, um, and and try to keep keep it as uh, as open uh, as a forum as we could. Um, I, I'd say the outreach with these is always a challenge. You know, as far as getting uh, getting all the stakeholders engaged at the right time, um, and even even currently, you know, up here in Alaska, there's a few uh, industry council and coordination council groups where we, we, we meet on a, on a quarterly basis throughout the year, um, and that's continued in the, the virtual environment, um, that, you know, up, at least up here in Alaska, we've, we've really tried to keep that as, as open as we could, um, you know, to where to, to get involved is, um, you know, usually just as simple as, as a simple request. Okay, thanks, Dave. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? Okay, uh, I, I do see another comment. I was trying to see if somebody was here to help answer this, but I can give it a shot. Um, 
from Scott, are ideas submitted by private company to the aviation weather request form publicly viewable or can ideas and topics remain proprietary? So the answer to both is yes, I believe. I was, I want to see if Pat Murphy, um, who manages our, our requirements branch was on, but I don't see him. So um, I believe that submitters can request anonymity if they would like to. And um, I can verify that and uh, get back, Scott, if you'd let me know which Scott this is. Um, or I can get with Pat maybe before we're done here and find out if that's true. But I'm pretty sure that if you request anonymity, it will stay that way. One thing we are uh, working on doing is not only having that intake form, but also putting a recurring spreadsheet on the site to show what problems have been submitted and their status. We don't have that there yet, but that's something we're working on because of course we need to have people submitting problem statements or requests for something we've already been submitted or we're working on. Uh, but I'm pretty sure if, if on the form you say, you know, keep this proprietary or, or an or um, you want to do it anonymously, you can do that. Um, but I'll, I'll double check and get back before we're done here. Okay, thank you. This is Scott Sampson from Say Weather. Okay, all right. Hey, Scott. Anybody else on this topic? All right. Uh, let's see, continue holding stakeholder forums like FPAW. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I like that one a lot. Yeah, I thought you might and, like that and one. And I, I didn't put it up there either. <laughs> um, NOAA GSL can conduct observation impact studies from aircraft databases such as ADSB or UAS observations to demonstrate value to improved NWP and downstream use. So that sounds more like a statement. Um, what's the collaboration piece there? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, Bill, it's Curtis. Um, I think the idea would be, you know, if there is a compelling um, need for um, demonstrating value of certain data sets from the FAA's okay. perspective, for example, um, you know, if they want to, you know, to support the cost for, you know, some of the these platforms uh, in one way or another, you know, we can certainly provide uh scientific quantification of the value of the impact of those uh data sets um for improved weather forecasting amongst other things so i think it's an opportunity we, we've done this in the past with different data sets we've already shown uh even through peer-reviewed publications things like uh amdar you know the impact of uh, some other aircraft data sets to improve forecasts so we have a uh, infrastructure in place to to continue to do this for these newer and emerging observation types, if, if you want to have some quantification to motivate support for these systems. Okay, got it. Thanks, Curtis. Sure. Matt, did you want to speak to the one you entered there on the PK Express? <laughs> the PK Express, it sounds like a, a child's book or something like that. <laughs> um, so in, in yesterday's meeting uh, in the chat, uh, PK was having a conversation, I think, with Austin Cross uh, after Austin talked about their their summer experiments and the, the lab that they have there at the Aviation Weather Center. And uh, he, he expressed an interest in, um, uh, in, in coordinating or doing cross lab type works with their ATM lab. And, and the the thought that came to mind as I as I considered their conversation is that is that you know many of the organizations that participate in FPA, including NASA and the FAA and MITRE and um, Aviation, excuse me, Weather Center have either met labs uh, or ATM labs uh, where a lot of applied weather research is done. And I would speculate that that um, depending on what their focus at each of these labs is, that that none of them can do a a you know a high fidelity real conditions experiment as well as a combination of a if you will a met lab and an ATM or applied meteorology lab could do uh, again in combination with one another. And so the, the the question that came to my mind was if if that in fact is the case 
how do we how do we set up that collaboration or that that uh, that that cross conversation um, you know between Audi between the Idea Lab between AWC's uh, lab and NASA's ATM lab. Okay, thanks, Matt. Anybody want to respond or add to that? No hands raised on that. Um, Kate's not here to um, talk about the simulation environment, but they, um, the uh, research that NASA has been doing in that area recently is, and, and particularly for uh, AAM and, and UAM, um, have been to construct a live virtual distributive collaborative environment. I forget the exact acronym, and I may not have just translated that properly, but um, but they're they built their simulation capabilities to be able to connect uh, to other simulation capabilities as well as to take data into the simulation from actual light operations. So there are certainly opportunities there that they've uh, set the the foundation for. So if um, if there are uh, folks on this call that are interested in whether or not they would be able to connect, uh, those those opportunities certainly exist. Obviously, you'd have to work out the the actual interfaces, but um, but they have that uh, they've built that capability in. Okay. Thanks, Steve. So, so Bill, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm watching the uh, the comments come across here, or the, the the brainstorms come across, and and I'm I'm struck by the 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 one or two that that talk about FPA playing a role in this collaboration. And I, I must naively and honestly say I hadn't really considered. I, I mean, I know that's what we do, but I hadn't considered, you know, that 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 people would 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 bring that up or would say, you know, maybe you need to be more formal in the way that you do your collaboration, or maybe maybe you need to be better advertised than 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 is the case right now. And and um I'm 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 just um I'm I'm pondering that. <laughs> That's interesting to me. Well yeah, I was just looking at the comment there about F being a repository for aviation weather information sharing. Um, I hadn't thought necessarily about FPAW that way, and I guess I can um, toss that to you and, and to Matthias, but certainly there's a level of effort required database-wise and things like that to manage some sort of repository. I know uh, within my own division, we've got a person dedicated to doing that, not full-time, but as part of their job, um, to making sure that we get the intake and we get it to the proper branch within our division or within the FAA to another line of business when we have stakeholder questions and whatnot come in. So there's certainly a level of effort there, but that would be a good public repository for um, aviation problem statements and things like we're gathering today, for example, for people to submit to and, and review. Um, Matthias and, and Matt, do you have any, I'm sure you have a comment on that. <laughs> I'm well, going to defer to, to my wiser colleague. Matt would say we are a volunteer effort grassroots. Right. We have no resources. Right. And that's certainly one limiting aspect. But the other one is also, you know, information sharing. What's the scope? Because this could mushroom into something huge quickly, uh, depending on how you set this up. And so we'd have to think about that a little more carefully as to what we advertise there in a certain way i could see that and we have placeholders actually on the fpa website where we could have links let's say to ams aram committee or the aram conferences and what venues are happening out there where you may be participating in etc part of why this hasn't been fully or more fully fleshed out is essentially time limitations and the effort it takes to do that. So it, it's really a matter of what the scope is, how much of an information sharing platform FPAW should be or we want it to be, and how can we support that? Back to you, Matt. 
<laughs> I'm going to say what he said. <laughs> and I assume that was the answer. It, you know, when it's not part of your day job um, as a volunteer, it can get to be kind of overwhelming. And of course, volunteers come and go. And if you're setting up a database, who would take care of it and things like that? But uh, it, it might be something if we could somewhat automate it which I wouldn't know how to do. I don't have that expertise, but um, that would keep it more in the public realm as opposed to our repository for problem statements we have coming into the FAA. Um, so that would be something that we could certainly think about. Um, the weather tool capability demo through the aviation weather test bed. So again, I'm not exactly sure what the collaboration message is there. If uh, the submitter could talk to that yeah, Bill, or anybody Bill. from AWC. That was me. I didn't see anybody from AWC on here, although I think I saw Matt Strahan. Yeah, pop I saw up. Matt Strahan come on, so we, we can always put Matt on the spot. We could. I, I'll, I'll just say I added that in the spirit of if Matt's comment above that, just as, you know, it's a, it's a center and their effort is to try to reach out with different agencies for different purposes. Um, so I think they kind of, I don't want to say they get overlooked, but we do sometimes get overlooked. And it's just another forum for people to kind of reach out and get, you know, a level of collaborative effort. Um, but I, I added in the chat, you know, something, some of the lessons I learned from my time at the AWT was that, you know, a lot of these multi-agency center lab collaborations, when they get together, one of the biggest challenges we seem to have is knowing all the roles and responsibilities of each center in the collaboration, collaborative effort for that project. Um, you know, you'll have one agency or lab that builds out everything and everybody else just kind of observes it. Um, and so it does, it, it creates some some different challenges. So I just I just wanted to put that out there and, that, and that's just my two cents. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and this is Matt Strahan. I'm still catching up on the conversation, so I don't really have anything to offer. I'm just, just dropped in to say hi, really. Yeah, I saw you just dropped in. But you got to be careful when you drop in because then we put you on the spot. All right. What, what What's the question? Maybe I can try. So we're talking about collaboration, Matt, um, both within the government and public-private and uh, what are suggestions to do better collaboration. And um, on the bottom left there, it says weather tool capability demo through the aviation weather test bed. And that's what Brian was just talking about. So collaboration through the test bed was sort of the statement. Well, and, and, and Matt, Matt, this is Matt Franzak to add just a little bit more context. You know, we had we've had three days of discussions and what we're trying to do now to the extent that it makes sense is to kind of recap, review and or add um, information to the discussions we heard over the last three days. In this case, on the topic of uh, federal aviation weather collaboration opportunities. So, so this, this mural space here is for people to put in some, some, you know, some ideas about how to, how to enhance, how to do collaboration uh, on, on the topic of aviation weather. Well, I've been at AWC now, 10 almost 11 years and i've seen a lot of collaboration in the test bed that was some of it quite impressive i mean we've had people from all over the world come in and work there much less you know from the u.s i think with covid that's all stopped but i hope it starts up again because it seemed to be pretty useful for developing something new like the ultimate collaboration, the TCF project, was developed there. Uh, some work we've done with the UK Met to help out with WAFs and to help out with Stratus and Fog. And yeah. So, uh, and just off the top of my head, that's that's been a nice nexus for collaboration. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, Dave, bigger disco, you got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to kind of, um, you know, pick up what uh, Brian and, and Matt are kind of saying there to run with it in terms of, of doing that collaboration through the test bed. So <clears throat> I think Joshua had mentioned it or, or Austin had mentioned 
the work that we do with Audi in the test bed and the human factors piece and what that's led to. You know, you heard Matt just mention transition or development and, and refining of, of um, certain tools and products. And that does uh, include industry as well. Um, so I, I would I would keep this at the fore. I, I know in the past, you know, pre-COVID, you know, we tried to do two experiments a year with that. Um, but I would keep that to the to the fore. I, I think that is a really great uh, collaborative opportunity. And, and to be honest, um, it's probably one that I thought everybody kind of maybe already knew about, but I'm, I'm, I'm now seeing maybe not so much. Um, so it just has a great place there. And I, I see Matt's got his hand up, so I'll yield uh, the floor to him. Okay, thanks. I was going to just add, you know, the nice thing about the test bed is you can take stuff there and throw it into our operations once you get it kind of sort of operational in, in the test bed. And I think that the EPIC, the Global Ensemble Prediction for Oceanic Convective Hazards, was a good example of that, as is some of the lightning detection capability. You get that in front of the forecasters, you get pretty good feedback and, and they'll They'll tell you pretty quick if they like it. OK. Thanks, Matt. Any other conversation on AWC's collaborative work? Of course, the other parts, the getting in front of customers through our website. The, you know, it's probably the most recognized aviation weather website, so it'd be the quickest way to get it in front of people. And and you may have missed it at the before you were here, Matt, I mentioned and the URL is there in, in the um, in the mural app here for the uh, aviation weather request form that we have on FAA.gov now where any stakeholder in the NAS can make a request through a problem statement that goes to Pat Murphy shop um, that we can evaluate and possibly validate as a requirement which of course, if it was something that AWC could help us with, we would work with them on that and collaborate. But we do have that intake form there uh, for requests for stakeholders in the NAS. Doesn't it seem like we should put a link to that on our website? That's kind of what I was just thinking. And maybe we can have an offline discussion about that and, uh, and do that. And it is on our public website, of course. So there's nothing secret or government only about that. Uh, one thing I was thinking about, and somebody actually put that in here about the role of IMCO ICAMS um, in this area about collaboration. So um, that is one of the roles of ICAMS, as the old OFCM was, for 15 federal agencies to uh, communicate, communicate and collaborate. And the thing that had come to my mind is being part of ICAMS on the Committee for Services and the Subcommittee on Weather Services is we still need volunteers. So um, many of the subcommittees are lacking the right number of people and the diversity from multiple agencies. It's very, very heavily NOAA populated. And um, there's 14 other federal agencies out there that do stuff with weather. And I'll put in a, a plug for ICAMS. If folks are interested in volunteering, you have to be a federal employee and, and not a contractor to federal employee. You have to be a true fed, uh, but you can participate on the various uh, committees and subcommittees, and that will allow you to collaborate across the federal weather enterprise uh, with your peers and, and others working on weather problems. So I don't know if Dave Chorney is still on, but uh, Dave, if you wanted to add to that, um, it's volunteer. So it's a, a little bit like FPAW. It's uh, above and beyond your normal duties, but it does allow you to communicate and, and lead. Uh, some of the subcommittees, there's chairs and co-chairs that can lead those. You get leadership experience, and I know they're looking for uh, specifically a lot of uh, 12, 13s, and 14s in the government to support those ICAM subcommittees. And if you want to know how to do that, don't contact me. Contact Dave Chorney uh, or through the ICAM's website. You can find that, and uh, you have to be nominated. Uh, you can't just join, uh, but you have to be nominated and make sure you have the expertise to join a specific committee. Um, um, can Dave, I add in one thing, right? Bill? Um, so you have to be um, 
approved by a senior level executive with ICAMS, you can't just say, I'm gonna do it and do it. Right. And actually that's one of the things with ICAMS, it goes up and down the chain. Um, and they want senior leaders approving all people working in ICAMS. So the senior people for ICAMS will contact the head of F Department of Transportation or FAA, Department of the Air Force or Navy or DOD um, to approve if you are going to be a member of ICAMS. And you have to be a federal uh, or in military. You cannot be a contractor. That's some of the rules. But for the folks, the, the federal employees out there, you know, it's it's pretty good resume fodder to get approval from an executive to join that with your subject matter expertise. And also um, having that expertise is great to the federal enterprise for that collaboration. I didn't realize how many federal agencies were really involved in weather uh, until I was involved with OFCM, the precursor to ICAMS, and uh, never really thought about some of the other agencies. I always think about you know, NOAA and Air Force and Navy and FAA, especially from an aviation perspective, but um, the USGS and others are part of that, and they do um, need weather support or produce weather capabilities, uh, including space weather type stuff. So uh, that's a plug for ICAMS. Uh, opportunities to transition successful research projects from government to industry. Um, we do that through our weather technology in the cockpit. I know uh, Gary Picodner, who's on here, could talk about that for hours. He leads our, our WIDIC program. That's what we do is transition our, our WIDIC capability to private industry. Uh, but let's open that up for discussion, see if anybody uh, wants to talk about it or, if, or whoever submitted that, uh, what the thought is there. Nobody. Hey, hey, Bill. All right, Randy. I submitted that. There you go. Um, you know, yes, WIDIC does a very good job of that. AWRP does not or has not in the past, but it's something that we're, you know, looking into. Um, and, and I guess that's that's a that's an issue that's not on here that we could completely talk about is how long it takes to implement anything from research to operations, um, but uh, especially in the inside the government, but you know, industry is much faster about doing that. So we are looking at uh, potential for uh, um, you know, transitioning some of the things and, and granted they'll still go to the weather service or FAA or wherever, but there are opportunities um, to uh, maybe give these out or lease them out or sell them or whatever the, the term may be uh, to industry and let them run with it because they can do it much faster than we can. And, you know, NASA does that pretty well also. Um, when, when I was in private industry, a lot of the capabilities we developed for the Space Launch Program, NASA used to push us to uh, make that a, a commercially viable product if we could and actually make money off it um, because they were allowing that capability, which are the, which gives NASA um, visibility because it came from them, um, but they wanted to push it out to private industry, uh, things that were developed and, and private industry could use. So uh, that was unique to me because I always thought that would be um, intellectual property of the government, but uh, they, they actually requested us to do that on any projects we could. So. Not sure how that works across the government, but any uh, contractors that are working on stuff could possibly have that ability to do that too. Anybody else in addition to what Randy had to say about that? And and Bill um, and and Randy, I, I don't I don't know how well uh, either you or the um, um, the 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 other folks on the call. Um, understand how for instance an ffrdc works but uh, but miter and and the and casd the center that i work for that supports the faa um you know we we are a nonprofit. we do not make stuff we we correction we do not manufacture things for sale but we do make stuff 
uh, in 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 exploring new ways of of doing a variety of things, and we have well-established tech transfer mechanisms that are in place to uh, and available, frankly, to to uh, you know to anyone who meets whatever the criteria are for that tech transfer. And I'm thinking specifically as I'm talking now about about uh, for instance the uh, the uh, the the, the uh, cockpit cognitive assistant that MITRE has had under development and, and, and prototyping and experimentation for a number of years now called uh, Digital Copilot. And, and we see people, you know, we hear people referring to Digital Copilot. We refer to it as if it's a thing, but it's only a thing in the sense that it's run on MITRE property. However, there are some components of ForeFlight and there are some components of some of the other commercial um, uh, cockpit systems that that came from the digital co-pilot type work that was done and have been tech transferred out to industry. So, and, and to the best of my knowledge, and I may be being extraordinarily naive saying this, but to the best of my knowledge, um, there is there is no cost of that tech transfer. It's I believe it's open to anybody who meets the criteria of the tech transfer. So, so you know. Basically, somebody let's let's just say, for instance, that some of the work that that is being done in in um, I don't know the gee the the the, the micro scale modeling type work that 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 uh, that our colleague Mike Robinson is working on maybe that that obtains a critical mass and somebody says I want to be able to do that. I believe the answer is you can. You just have to have the tech transfer done from MITRE over to whoever that partner is. And um, we have done that in, in AWRP. I know, Randy, we do transition a lot to weather service, but one of our big successes over to private industry is the work that Tammy Flo has done with uh, the GTG Nowcast, which is now running at NCAR um, while we wait for weather service to get the capability, the resources to do it. But private industry has picked up the gridded fields from the um, graphical turbulence guidance. That's what GTG stands for. A now cast updated every 15 minutes and uh, commercial airlines can get that up to their cockpit. They've got 15 minute updates of turbulence on their route. So um, that is one success, Randy, I can think of for uh, AWRP. Right. Yeah, but, in, but traditionally we have been kind of focused just on the the government to government transition. But uh, we certainly see the opportunities and the potential for uh, uh, cross coordination and collaboration with industry on on some of these things as well. And we are trying to get away from developing products and have capability. Right. For example, gridded fields. So if you put gridded fields on a server. Private industry can come get those fields from from the government servers and then create whatever products they might want to out of that for their own use. So that that is out there as well. Um, another topic I see on here is enhanced coordination among funding agencies about joint research and development efforts. So we do that to a certain extent within the, the federal government, certainly not as well as we can and probably because Oddly enough, different government agencies have different types and years of funding and things like that. But um, one recent example I can think of, and I guess if Kevin Johnston, our panelist, is still here, uh, Kevin, you can put your NASA tinfoil hat on. Um, <laughs> the, the work that we've been doing with advanced air mobility and the SBIRs that NASA has been working with, giving the FAA opportunity to have input to the SBRs that NASA is funding at no cost to the FAA. So there's one example of uh, agencies working together, uh, joint research with funding. Kevin, I don't know if you, you can speak to that, if you're still on. Yeah, I'm, I'm still on, Bill. Okay. Um, yeah, it was good that they uh, opened it up with us, uh, our involvement and input. And uh, they've got several SBIRs uh, going on, looking at urban air uh, mobility and uh, true weather with uh, Don Birchoff and also developing uh, uh, R&D roadmaps. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's been good to be involved with them on that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, anybody else think of any other examples of uh, the funding agencies doing joint research? OK, 
Uh, yeah, I couldn't think of any off the top of my head. I see uh, Joe Bracken had a comment about Melissa Wagner on the second day of F. Paul spoke to coordination and collaboration with emergency managers to share information and data. Um, Joe, do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, what I did, Bill, was went back through my notes on Tuesday or the, on day two and just noted some of the areas where collaboration was was identified. And Melissa had that in one of her slides that there was some collaboration going on there with the emergency manager. So I don't know if that was worth capturing as a collaboration effort or activity or area of need or not. OK, all right. Yeah, thanks. Hey, hey Bill, the, yeah. the, the obvious one is OPC and. Uh, course <laughs> global synthetic weather global radar. synthetic weather radar yep yeah that, that's a very good point um randy started the opc work the offshore precipitation capability at the request of our um air route traffic control centers in the oceanic region on the, the east coast and caribbean and through technical exchange meetings that randy also started working with uh, air force weather they looked at that and they said hey great idea we'll pick it up from here and create a capability for their global needs and also a forecast component to that uh, which they call global synthetic weather radar and we call it opc but faa funded the basic work on that that mit lincoln lab did and then air force picked up on that and funded their piece of it and we now have the ability to do a forecast component if we want to based on the air force's funding and the work they've done so that's that's right randy that's a great example of uh, multiple agencies funding joint research. Uh, that, that is a perfect example. And uh, we just need to do about 15 more of those across the board in a variety of areas to, to, to make some progress like that. I, you, you know what, I was completely brain dead on that too. And here we, we talked about that like yesterday and the day before both. Yep, yep. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Aviation wind energy collaboration with respect to cloud cover and wind forecast probabilities. Um, whoever submitted that, if you want to show yourself and yeah, Bill. so Bill, this was this was another comment from Joe or up okay. further up. So I went in and added it for him. Um, okay, great. As he was going through his notes. Okay. Yeah, this was something that Matthias had brought up on day. Three, I think, um, just talking about with with the wind energy providers and the forecasting that they do. Is that another area of collaboration? And I think I would possibly extend that. And weather service, please correct me or excuse me, but to fire weather, uh, it seems like there'd be a collaborative property there as well. Absolutely, there's a lot of opportunities there in the low altitude boundary layer research, the DOE we heard from from Sally yesterday too, what they are doing, this this all is sort of related and and capabilities are developed that can be applied one way or another. And there's clearly opportunities that aviation could benefit from that too. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Matthias. Um, let's see, I'm looking at the comments. Um, how do we facilitate resources, people, funding, collaboration between the MET R&D community and the aviation weather user, i.e. ATM R&D community? This is me, Bill. This is something that this is this is a um, a a. Um, um, a windmill that I, Sancho Panza, have been tilting at for many, many years to get a, a combined funded, combined resourced weather and ATM R&D project going. And as opposed to uh, R&D happening in our R&D silos of excellence. And, and uh, there probably are some examples out there, and I'm probably being overly harsh, but but by and large, it can, it's a it's a very very difficult thing to accomplish, and, I, and I'm specifically thinking, frankly, now back to Kevin Johnston and Bruce Carmichael's comments from earlier about 2007 and the the weather ATM integration work group and this whole notion of translation and 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 integration into DSTs and which gee we just need to figure out how to do a successful one of those and 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 use it as a, a banner to. To, uh, to to show how stuff can be done. 
Uh, and we've certainly struggled with that within the FAA. You know, Randy talked about AWRP and their focus is delivering capability to the National Weather Service for the benefit of the uh, national airspace system. But part of our charter is to develop capabilities for our own employees, the air traffic management community, the controllers. And we haven't done a good job at that. And uh, part of that's because you've got us meteorologists talking weather speak and you've got controllers talking controller speak. And until you can come together and understand what each other's talking about, it, it's difficult to do that. We're trying to do that through the community of interest where we have teams of people that include controllers as well as the Mets so they can maybe start to translate and talk to each other. Because if I have a controller telling me I want to see weather on the glass and you ask them for more details, they say, you know, like rain and stuff. Well, that doesn't help us. You mean precipitation fields? Well, yeah, that's what I think I mean. And you keep working closer to closer until you understand what their requirement is. Then that's something we can work at as the Met R&D community, but we don't speak the same language and we're trying to break down that barrier and work better together on that. And I'm sure that's not just internal to FAA, but if you look across things like ICAMS and you've got Department of Energy talking about wind energy and you've got a meteorologist it, working marine stuff, they they don't speak the same language either. So um, it, it takes a lot of effort to do that. I remember doing that in the Air Force. Anybody that's on this call that's been involved as a meteorologist or oceanographer, you ask your customer what they need and it's always, well, give me the best you can. Well, no, I really need your, your wind limitations. Just give me the best you can, you know, and we'll worry about that. Well, it doesn't work well that way. And we see that also within our, our own agency. So I think that's a, a key point there, Matt, to break down that barrier and, and talk the same language. Yeah, and I'm going to pile on just a little bit and and in, then invite two of our participants to, to pitch in because they were involved in this conversation. Uh, Bill, you've talked about the, and, and this is not a, FPA is not all about the weather COI, but the weather COI has come up a lot. For, and I think for, for, for correct reasons, uh, one of the working groups, uh, we call them special weather action teams that I participate on, uh, is the wind forecast SWAT. And um, we, we uh, amongst our members or, or through um, assigned to our group were a half a dozen, seven, I forget what the, the number was, um, problem statements, including uh, one whose who's, um, submitter uh, was a, uh, a a terminal controller who who correctly said, you know, I don't get any wind information. I have no availability to wind information where I work and have to either infer it by looking at ground speeds of aircraft and take my best guess as to what's going on at the various altitudes, or I've got to reach out to the air, aircraft and ask for wind checks and you know get get from them what they're what they're reading on their instrumentation. And so, so a problem statement was submitted to to um, to try to address that that gap. Well, um, a well-meaning person got a hold of it and and decided that that yeah, that was a good problem statement and it could even do more. And Mr. Well-meaning added some more text to it before it was submitted. Mr. Well-meaning, by the way, is not an air traffic controller, and uh, and in the course of doing that, the 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 problem statement morphed to the point that the submitter said, "This isn't what I submitted," and and y'all are missing the point of what it is that I was looking for here. Now, Mr. Well-meaning was leaning a little bit further forward and thinking perhaps ahead of where the submitter was thinking, but but the point is that the submitter knew what the problem was knew what a solution would be. Yes, it involved a controller doing mental gymnastics to, to take this wind information and turn it into an environmental picture, but it was still an appropriate thing to ask. And, and a non-controller got in and trying to make it better probably made it worse. So, so we, we need to work together on this and we need to understand well what the users really, really need. And at the same time, we got to get the users to be leaning a little bit further forward than sometimes they are when they're involved in their day-to-day -day battles like, like they are. Right now, we have a great advantage at this point in time with Eric Avila. 
So Eric is our uh, National Air Traffic Controllers Association, NATCA um, representative on the weather COI and other things we're doing. He's a card carrying meteorologist and a controller. So he speaks both languages and he's involved in a lot of uh, the work that we're doing. I saw Eric uh, at least earlier on the meeting. I don't know if he's here now. Uh, yeah, but I'm great here. to have I'm here, you here, Eric. So yeah, great to have somebody with your capability to be able to help us speak both those languages and, and make that uh, translation. Yeah, that, that is the hardest part. It's, it's it's like you just mentioned a couple minutes ago. Sometimes <clears throat> what controllers want doesn't translate into what we can provide or what the science, uh, you know, where the science is. So that's definitely always the hard part uh, with, with work, work on both sides. So, yeah, I'm happy to be here and part of it. And, and we're happy to have you. We like the, the work that you're doing with us. And, and the bad part also can be when you do finally understand each other and then you say, yeah, but we can't do it. Well, then they get mad at you. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it works both ways. Um, it goes along with the territory. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, Matt, is there anything else that we've missed on here? Uh, there's a sticky put on there about CONOPS development for ADSV oh. weather ground data distribution, which is a great topic and one that, you know, we think about if we can just get this information from the airplane to the ground, everything will be fixed. And then we forget that it's got to go from the ground to the ground to the ground to the ground to the ground at that point. Yep, good point. I know uh, Cami has taken a, a, a look at uh, that. Um, Gary Picodner. Can I put you on the spot a little bit here? I know if you've... Uh... Now, we have a project with that. We're looking at that and working with Steve Dar. Um, part of the interface that Pegasus is doing is what you saw as a demo. And it's already sort of at a, I don't know what you call it, a framework, or it's not quite even a prototype, but it's a framework that works to actually format it in a pirate format that could then just be converted to the format that ADSB weather needs. So once it's there, a pilot could just speak into his speaker right on the aircraft and have the PIREP encoded in the PIREP code and sent down over the data link. And that code could be changed from what's current PIREP code to what the con or what the spec is for ADSB weather. So we're more or less ready with an enhancement once that data link is in place. At the same token, it also adapts to the PIREP project we're briefing that we've been talking to you about and we spent this morning talking about of expanding it. So this is just one means. We're looking at every means to get it off the aircraft because we're told still a lot of aircraft, especially in some of the remote locations, are not ADSB equipped. And we really want to get a lot of those remote areas are where really where you want the weather. So the places where a lot of guys are flying without ADSB are a lot of the areas like remote Alaska where we're having the accidents and they lack the information. So you sort of have both. So that's why we're looking at options to be able to just use VHF radio as well, which is pretty much on every aircraft. Um, and granted, you still sometimes have places where the radio can't reach anybody, but we're trying to look at all options of current configurations. Obviously, uh, connectivity is going to increase, and we have an active WIDIC project with Steve Dar to work version three and to incorporate them with Pegasus and Interface. Yeah, and I know uh, Cammy's also looking at uh, talking to the frequency managers about getting a dedicated frequency. A dedicated frequency, right. That's that's the part because right now is VHF is pretty much in these remote areas is what they've got. And there are still a lot of people that don't have ADSB and right. don't want to spend on their aircraft. So we really want to be able to reach everybody. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, and Thanks for your support from the Next Gen Weather uh, Office. The, I was the one who sent this one over to Brian. Um, specifically, the um, what I was uh, trying to get at was the part that Matt uh, Franzak talked about. How you know, once it's in the ether, how do we get it to the users? And the um, Aviation Weather Center uh, uh, director Bob Maxson has has gotten no to designate. AWC is the lead entity within NOAA to develop that uh, that CONOPS for um, moving the data around and, and, and getting it to the users and, and um, 
uh, and, and you're supporting that uh, with Eldridge Frazier, and we've got some folks out of PMO, um, and um, we could use we could use an ATO person, but um, uh, essentially it's a it's a, an effort to um, first identify you know what data uh, comes, and it's not just PyREP, um, but also the automated uh, air reports and um, and then, you know, who can use it and for what purposes and make sure that we've got folks into the ComOps that that uh, fully explores that uh, space so that when uh, when we go to turn the ComOps into an infrastructure that, um, uh, that moves the data, we've got um, we've got a good sense of of what's uh, what's needed and. Um, and you know, at some point, we're going to go out from this little tiger team that we've put together uh, to a wider community um, and and ask them to you know validate the conops and make sure that we have identified uh, you know all the different uh, places the data needs to go and how it needs to be uh, QC'd and delivered and all those sorts of things. Okay, thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, looks like we're Right up against our break, Matt. Uh, one thing I did want to mention to Scott Sampson, I did get an email back from Pat Murphy, and he said he thinks by default that the information is kept proprietary and it may even be a disclaimer for our um, intake for problem statements. He's double checking with our project lead on that, and uh, you know we'll try and have a final answer on that uh, before we end for the day here. Matt, I will turn it back over to you as we're a minute past our ending point for this session. Very well. So uh, I think we have a 15 minute break scheduled here. Uh, so let's go ahead and take that now. And um, or, or did I move things around? I don't, heck, I don't remember anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. It's a 15 minute break. We have. Uh, well, actually, we were supposed to be done at two thirty, so we're running fifteen minutes late. Sorry about that. No, that's 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 quite all right. Let's let's take a fifteen minute break now. We'll come back a, a minute or two past the top of the hour, and uh, we'll finish up with the final session and then some closing thoughts. So, thank you all. Well, folks, I have three o two on the nose. Uh, I think that means that we're in the home stretch. I must say that four days of, of four plus hour meetings plus the prep on either side that, that goes with it is, is just is, is a, a real drag. So uh, I'm, I don't know how much energy I'm going to have left to to propel us across the finish line and we'll rely on all of you to, to help me to do so. So the, the final um, brainstorming uh, information gathering session uh, of the day is in regards to uh, tangible outcomes from the, the, uh, the TEM, the technical exchange meeting that is concluding today. In other words, what, what do we collectively want to come out of this that we can hold in our hands or point at in a, in a document somewhere or go to a website someplace and say, here, here is what was discussed and here is what came out of it. And, um, and, and in that same vein, uh, who uh, should be requested, since we're all volunteers, to, to do that thing, whatever it may be. Um, I did um, manage to figure out a very kludgy way to keep the previous um, brainstorming mural up and, um, and, and uh, Therefore, keep everybody who is logged into it uh, logged in. Uh, however, I will um, reshare for those who would like the link on the chat page uh, right now uh, as I speak. 
And if if anybody is not logged into it and wishes to contribute to uh, the mural brainstorming page, um, here is your link. Just put on the, uh, the the team's chat page to do so. Uh, we do have two stickies that have already been deposited here, and I believe one was by me. I know one was by me, and the other was by Matthias. So. Uh, so clearly, we've already reached into and, and used our bag of tricks to put some information in here. Um, I would certainly love to see some other ideas of, of you know, what, what it is exactly that we can do um, to, to, instead of, as, as uh, Matthias or, or whomever it was, said earlier being um being caught in a vicious cycle of having great conversations every six months and then nothing happening in between the the intervening time period what what can we do to 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 help to to help push these issues that we've identified uh, along and uh so uh one of the things that that uh that of course i thought of since i'm in part um, responsible for it is to get all the material that um, that that we put together during this TEM available on the FPA website and and uh, this is my add-on do it in less than three months or four months time which I think was my performance last time around and I'm happy to report that I am actually about one half to two thirds of the way home on 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 getting that done, I've been able to keep up with it um, uh, after the meetings and and have a, a a real good start on it. But if there is any material that has been um, shared that um, is not in the hands of the session leads or myself or Matthias right now, and and that that we should uh, share on the FPA uh, meeting website, please do send it our way so that we can uh, we can do so. Um, Randy, if you're still there, yes, you're still here. I understand that uh, that Dave Lindsay's presentation from yesterday was humongous and and that was why he um, uh, uh, did the presentation himself. Is this something that we could pick up through like a secure file transfer method or something like that? Potentially. Um... It was very strange. It's 128 megabytes, and when I tried it via the FAA, it would not work. When I tried it from my home laptop, because he sent it to my personal email, um, it would not work. When I tried it on my phone, it downloaded quickly. So, <laughs> I, so I have no idea why it did that. Um, but maybe we can see because a lot of that was he had those uh, animations and things in it. If he uh, if he deletes those, it'll probably be a lot smaller, and we can we should be able to share it fairly easily. Okay, yeah, but those animations were kind of cool. I'd hate to delete those. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, and the same thing happened to Jeff Weinrich when he sent it to him. It wouldn't work for him either. So really, okay. Um, the other the other thing I want to mention while while I'm talking um, the slides from Carl Garman were not releasable, so we won't be able to add those. Okay. Randy, did you try the FLY website on FAA? Um, I did not. I, I'm not sure if somebody outside the FAA can upload to it. I know it's a way we can share large files. That may be some way we could look into it. Um, or if somebody has a personal OneDrive or Dropbox or something like that to get the file to, then maybe we could get it up to FPAW. They could grab it or we could put it on our KSN mat or our COI KSN to move it. That that would be that's a great idea, Bill. If we can if we can get it to the KSN site, then I can grab it from there. Absolutely. If if somehow I can get it from my phone to my computer, I can I can get it over there. Okay. Very good. Um, I will. I be. I'm 99% sure we'll be able to make the uh, the the murals that we use to do brainstorming um, available on the FPA website. So that'll all be part of the material. Um, I, I want to take a minute. Uh, you know, I probably should do this at the at the very end, but I want to take a minute now 
um, to 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 give a huge shout out to Joe Bracken, who um, who who used to have hands and fingers big enough to palm a basketball, but right now about all he can palm is a baseball because he's been typing so dang hard on his keyboard, taking notes for us every day. And and uh, and Joe, thank you, sir, very much, um, very much appreciated. Um, <laughs> way. Uh, Way underappreciated by everybody, and and you do a, you do a very. For um, um, making that available to to the F. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Matt. Glad to help. <clears throat> Hang on one. All right, so um, my goal is to actually have everything available uh, and uh, available to Rhonda and Matthias material-wise by either tomorrow or the early part of next week, which will be a, a, a huge surprise to them and, and me too if I can actually meet that. So, so as far as, you know, as far as people reviewing what was said, what was what was what was shared. Um, I, I hope all of that is available in the very near future. But that really doesn't, um, you know, that that's just that's kind of like raw weather information, right? And and now somebody's going to have to translate that into something. And I think maybe what Matthias um, has put on what I believe is his sticky note is is a little bit more of that uh, of that translation. How do we? How do we take this information and turn it into something useful? And what role, if any, does FPA or uh, uh, IMCO uh, ICAMS have to play in that? And Matthias, if if you don't if you don't mind, if that is your note, which I believe I saw your name on it when it was being written, if you don't mind elaborating, I, I'd be much appreciative. Well, you actually overinterpreted what I was putting down there, that was a simple observation or a, a wishful thinking that we created or enhanced a shared situational awareness of what's going on uh, related to aviation weather across the agencies, the federal agency landscape. And uh, th that is a tangible outcome, I think, from, from this term. But I hope that it doesn't stop with that, that we actually set something in motion that will, you know, keep going and, and foster additional exchanges down the road that ultimately lead to more collaborations and other beneficial outcomes. And, and Randy, you flashed up a second ago. Did you have a, an add on to that? No, I'm not sure why I flashed then. OK. Very good. Uh, Contact list of attendees. Uh, help me out. Can we do that? I mean, we've we done it in the past with that Paw meetings. Is there, is there, is there, are there any sort of privacy issues that go along with that that um, that we'd be violating? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it because we had some folks on this list that sit in pretty high up position as to what they're doing, and they may possibly not want their email to be broadly distributed, for example. Right. So I don't know how, how we should handle that. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking out loud here. I, I do think, you know, I, identifying a person who attended without necessarily giving away contact information without permission would not necessarily be a, a bad thing. I mean, they were here and they were seen by everybody. And, and in the recordings, you know, I, I think that uh, there, there's a possibility that that in some cases, you know, people who may not want their email sent out uh, can be seen speaking and and uh, and providing feedback. So, um, 
yeah, well, we we should we should we should think about this a little bit and and see what we can do without uh, without messing stuff up. What else, folks? What what sort of tangible outcomes can we can can we uh, um, produce out of this tem? I mean, is there something? This is, after all, an, an FPA meeting, an FPA activity, or an FPA sponsored, I suppose, activity. Is there is there something that we should that we should consider adding on, perhaps a um, a, a routine basis? You know, is 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 doing a a tem like this routinely? Um, you know, something that should be done, and is FPA the right venue in which to do it, or uh, or is is there a different venue in which to do it? And I, and I I'm I'm I have an opinion about that, but I'm going to keep my opinion to myself at the moment. Other than to say that I, I note that you know the weather COI is is participation on 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 the plenary is limited to the um invited coi members and participation on the special weather action teams uh, sorry I, I cut myself off too short is limited to the invited faa uh, members and participation on the uh on the swat special weather action teams is limited to um uh, relevant federal subject matter experts or uh non-federal subject matter experts who are under contract uh, to the FAA to provide some of their subject matter expertise, and so uh, it, it it clearly excludes a a large, relatively large, and I would say important part of the aviation weather user population. Similarly, you know, ICAMS we've just heard, and 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 its its parent body, IMCO, is is uh, limited to to true federal employees. So contractors who um, can participate in the uh, the FAA's weather COI in, 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 a, in a, a SWAT capacity uh, can't participate over there. Um, you know, with the AMS ARAM with which I am familiar is another venue, but it is a, it is a very, um, uh, it is a very, Weather atmospheric science oriented body as opposed to the more operational inclination, more operational flavor of this body, in my opinion. Uh, and and so um, so it's it's I don't think that's the right place either. In many respects, FPA is uniquely situated to kind of straddle all of these not fully open bodies um and and so i'll i'll just shut up there and ask for other comments from folks matt we have a couple questions in the in the chat um joe asked if we need to generate an action item list out of this sure as long as i'm not on that any of them <laughs> we, uh, we well, I, I, you know so uh, joe i know you did a great job of of picking that up through the first uh uh, three days, and and I think that that would be a that that'd be a wonderful thing to to generate as part of our report out. Um, you know, a, a standalone action item list. Yes, sir. And Matthias asks if there are key pockets of uh, aviation weather related activities in government that we have missed at all. I don't know anybody. I'm sure there are. Who are they? Obviously, like, they're not on the call. I'm, I'm sorry, Matthias, I stepped on you. Say again. Obviously, they are not on the call. We missed them. Well, well, yeah, yeah. It's. I, I was thinking, you know, it's it's the the age old you don't know what you don't know problem. Yeah, no, I, I I was trying to think in terms of, you know, as we went through these four days thinking about various aspects of what's going on, were there stuff 
popping up in our minds that, gee, we should have had those folks in this discussion. And so that maybe as we move forward, we need to make sure we reach out to, to those corners and, and bring those people into the dialogue as well. Yep. Yep, I think that would be a great idea. I was, I was, you know, we had a we had a fair amount of NASA participation uh, in the in the TEM and especially on on day two. Um, but but my sense is that they do a lot more work in this arena than uh, than a lot of the other participating agencies, and I guess. I guess I'm 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 wishing we had seen even more participation from NASA, from from you know some of the folks who are 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 there at um, uh, at Langley and and at, at at Marshall and and you know there's they 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 hit a lot of the same areas that that we talked about. I do see an item on the on the uh, the mural about uh, a shortfalls list for ICANs to pick up and address. Um, it will be, you know, so, so the so the 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 kind of grouped murals page mural page from the first of these sessions, the gaps session, will be available. And what I hear being asked for is a a list of those um, of those gaps on in like a a table or or something like that, which I think. I think that's probably something that I can do. Um, I also see another um, a, a sticky note about um, a list again of of needs or gaps, shortfalls that that um, might be best addressed through public private partnerships. Um, and I, and I find that to be a a very interesting request and and um i i i don't i don't quite know how to answer that one uh, anybody have any thoughts i know i i do know that or i think i know that the faa's Chief Scientist for NextGen has some some very firm opinions about areas that um, that should be enhanced or um, or or new new capabilities provided through public private partnerships, and I think he talked at length about one on. Tuesday when he spoke to the PIREFS piece, where I think he feels very strongly that there's a need for uh, collaboration across both sides of that fence. Um, but what what else? I, I do think that I know that the the FAA is going to be exploring the use of the cloud for relevant categories of data and information, which as things stand right now, probably does include weather data and weather information. Um, and and I, I'm, I am, this is a guess now, I am guessing that the FAA will not necessarily limit itself with respect to weather data and weather information to using its own internal cloud services, but but will certainly explore the, the possibility of using external cloud providers. Um, so that's just and and as, as as several of our presenters have have said during the the uh, three and a half, four days now, uh, those are my opinions and my opinions alone and do not necessarily represent those of the MITRE Corporation, the Center for Advanced Aviation System Development, or the FAA. So Matt, that I, is kind of a tough one there on um, the public-private partnerships. You know, there's ways to do that, for example, like a CRADA. Um, 
it, it's to me it seems like it often comes down to the funding um, where you may be asking a, a private industry to pony up some money, the government pony up some money um, as opposed to just you know, a, a contract through a federal agency to a private um, entity. And one of the things that you mentioned our, our chief scientist, Mr. Bradford, has talked about in the UAS world and, and even my own director, um, things like we're going to leave that up to the private to do. And a lot of that, I, I think that opinion is because if you look at UAS, they're not going to be running out of terminals like in the NAS, where the federal government has some oversight and regulatory, and we've talked about this with Gordy and other things. Um, but there's a partnership there, and I don't know how to list the needs and how to do this in, in somewhat of a broad sense, but we all know that the federal government's not going to be putting ASOSs every three meters across the country. No. Nope. So, you know, how does private industry get access to weather information, whether it's off their own drones they're flying or whatnot, but there's some public private entity there that we've talked about in the FAA, um, but that's almost, uh, you know, single agency FAA working with those other entities. I'm not sure how broad, like a list of needs could be addressed through something like that. That's that's really a tough one, unless anybody else has any other ideas out there. That's pretty difficult. Yeah. I like your, I, I like your, uh, your ASOS, AWOS um, analogy. And I was having a, a sidebar conversation yesterday um, with uh, with someone about the the VWAS, which is, you know, more or less, don't hold me to this exactly, but more or less an order of magnitude less expensive uh, than the AWAS ASOS is, and and that's a good thing, but it is still expensive enough that they're not going to be every three meters. All, they're, they're, they're still, they still cost a good chunk of change. And, and we need something that gets down into the several orders of magnitude cheaper than ASOS and AWOS to come up with a kind of observational density, you know, that we need, whether it's surface-based or whether it's, it's non-surface-based. And, and this is where the, the self-help out of the, 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 the UAS and AAM and, and and all the other communities that are clamoring for wind information in certain regimes, I, I, I think there's a, a, a there's a great deal of self help that can and should take place in that arena. Yeah, you know, one of the key components, obviously, to for aviation, <clears throat> including the UAS, is the low low level stuff, is ceiling and visibility because there's a huge network of personal weather stations out there <clears throat> that are incorporated into the MATIS data set, you know, weather underground and others. And for the most part, temperature and moisture is pretty good on those home weather stations. Sighting is always a problem. People put it in their backyard near trees and things like me, because I have no place else I can. Um, but there's good information there. But to fund a ceiling and visibility sensor is, is what makes these very, very expensive because you can get a Davis system for like 500 bucks and a couple hundred bucks more, get it on the internet. But you know, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars at least for these other systems that do have the visibility capability. So that's why we're looking at things like real time mesoscale analysis and other ways to get around actual observations and the sensors themselves, as we've talked about. Uh, I see Scott has a pretty good comment here. The FAA doesn't seem to do a lot with SBIR compared with other government branches. SBIR seems relatively easy to contract and engage with small business and to get shortcoming with NASA out to companies that could help develop solutions. Um, certainly NASA does a lot with SBIR. Um, I know Air Force and Navy do SBIR. I have not, in my four years now with FAA, seen much about SBIR. Randy, any inkling on our do we have an SBIR office within FAA? Is it something we can look into? Not that I know of. I know we have the uh, uh, grants program. 
um, that's you know a little bit similar, but not a uh, not a true SIBR program that or SBIR program that I know of. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. Uh, Scott says there is one within DOT. Um, it'd be yes. interesting. If- yeah. You're you're right. There is one. There is one at the DOT level. I don't believe there's one at the FAA level. I wonder if that's because our procurement system is AMS and it's not the typical uh, federal procurement system. So uh, this is Scott Sampson. There is a F, um, an SBIR topic list. Usually it's once a year through the DOT and there's the other Department of Transportation groups within that. And usually the FAA has only one or two topics or you know sometimes up to six I've seen. Um, but it might be a good way to get ideas, shortcomings within the NAS um, that could be published. And even if there's no viable solution submitted there, um, we've done like DOT or I'm sorry, um, DOD SBIRs before, and they're very easy from a um, a contracting point of view. They're they're usually fixed firm price, and and at least the the um, DOD it's it's very easy to set up both from the um, the small company point of view, as well as, uh, you know, transitioning that into a project. Yeah, so speaking of action items, Joe, if you would please, I guess I'll take one. Maybe I'll give it to Randy, but <laughs> uh, give it to us to take a look into the SBIR program. You know, if it's run through DOT and the FAA gets a couple of topics, they're probably competing for them. And I would imagine weather might be at the bottom of the barrel, but. Well, Joe, if you'd record that, so it's at least a reminder for us to take a look into that with our contracts folks, see what what possibilities might be there. You, you know what, uh, what Bill, I, I'm, I'm thinking that, that, um, that there needs to be almost a national competition put out to, to devise a dang dirt cheap CNV sensor. Yeah, and, and I, Jenny Calavito has looked into that uh, a bit for us in her program. She's our, our CNV project lead into things like low-cost ceilometer, um, low-power, low-cost, because one of the problems is there's not always a, a good electric grid for you. You're out in the middle of a field somewhere, and you need solar, and for a ceilometer, you, know, you just can't run it that way. It's, it, it's very difficult to do, but you're right. I, I've often thought about that for even a home weather station, mm. a very low cost way of looking at ceiling and visibility. And I could see cameras as one possibility. The edge detection works well in Alaska where you've got mountains to form an edge, but I couldn't see that working in the field in the back of my house, how, how you might do that. But maybe there's some smart folks out there that could do something like that. So if, if someone had an idea toward such, who would they talk to? Good question. <laughs> uh, can I suggest Walter Combs? His VWAS system has a much lower cost ceiling and visibility uh, sensing suite. Right, which is why it's, uh, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars cheaper than ASOS, AWAS, among other reasons. But, yeah. but I would, that was my point earlier, uh, Andy, is that we need to be another order of magnitude or more cheaper than that. I'm I'm good with that. <laughs> I I would say if somebody has an idea like that, I and mean, they can they can always email me, and um, I'll take a look at it, and we can either say, um, yeah yeah this has potential, let's let's look into it, or this is probably better served by such and such a group, or you know this is beyond scope of the FAA. And we can also, we can at least try to put it you know send it to the right group. Also, Sorry, who is this some talking? of these are like with the power apps, if we have that more cloud architecture on it, you could store all these items and call it under the new definition. And there are all sorts of ways to do ceiling. You can do it from an aircraft. If you're flying below a ceiling and you know it, you now know the bases. You can send that in. You could take a picture. If you're on the tops, you know your altitude, you take a picture, and the picture can estimate just how far you are above the clouds and you got cloud tops. And all those things in the right system would be a new type of PIREP. Uh, and you could get pretty accurate numbers. We're doing that out with some of the cameras in California, and we call them SkyReps. They're like every thousand feet, 
and you can tell if the camera's above or below the clouds, and it gives you a pretty good number on the bases and the tops, depending if it's down in the valleys there. So there's a lot of ideas out there, and that's really why we wanted to modernize what we call a PIREP, is to pull all that sort of observation, what I call observations of what's going on, and use that in some manner. Yeah, we could probably use something like that with the uh, uh, weather camera program too, because uh, one and of we the have, problems we're working on weather, weather briefers have is, uh, you know, telling a telling a pilot what we're looking at, um, and then trying to say, well, the ceiling isn't so and so because that's the highest uh, visibility marker that we have, or whatever. Um, you know, it isn't the ceiling isn't this, the visibility isn't that. Uh, getting an estimate would be really cool. And Scott, instead of emailing Randy, <clears throat> if anybody wanted to, we do have our portal. So ideas like that. Um, Here's the problem. We we can't afford to put weather sensors everywhere because the ceiling and visibility sensor is too expensive. Got it. Could we have could we look into a low cost ceiling visibility center to support UAS, you know, GA, whatever, then that would formally get it into our requirements process in our uh, policy and requirements branch. Very good. Thank you. Well, um, according to my recollection of the schedule, um, we had reserved the last 10 or 15 minutes uh, for Matthias and I to, uh, to kind of go over what's next. And um, so unless there are other um, comments or suggestions on the uh, tangible TEM outcomes, I would propose that we transition to this last little bit and, and then uh, we, we call it an FPAW. Hearing no objections, um, Matthias, you want to... My brain is just about dead. You want to um, you want to take a run at this, and I'll try to fill in whatever blanks may exist. Sure, I can get started. I know you will catch up with me. Uh, well, first, I would like to say thanks to all of you for really excellent participation in this technical exchange meeting. It it was really lively and and. I, I greatly appreciated how, how you participated here. That was wonderful. I also would like to thank Randy Bass, Nancy Mendonca, Jeff Weinreich, Rob Branham, and Matt Franzak for organizing this, Tim. I know there was a lot of effort going into this behind the scenes that many of you may not be aware of, uh, but it turned out well. We got really a uh, great lineup of speakers from various corners uh, across the agencies to talk about their needs or what's going on aviation weather related there. So uh, the discussions from my end, I felt like generated lots of information, but it remains to be further digested and and then followed up. And, and we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that because uh, it will take effort and time and people to do so. But ultimately, we hope that this Tim and I, I said that before in terms of tangible outcomes that it created a, a shared situational awareness, et cetera. But I really hope that, and, and I'm sure Matt and Randy and others are sharing that sentiment with me, that we hope that this will set something in motion that will really generate further discussions, further meetings that that foster uh, enhanced collaboration and enhanced sharing of information that will really benefit aviation and its stakeholders as we move forward. And lastly, I would like to point out uh, that on 
October 20th, that's a Wednesday, I believe, we will have our FPOP planning meeting at 11.30 Eastern, starting same time as we had uh, this week. Uh, the planning meeting to look forward at the spring FPOP meeting, what we will be talking about there or should be talking about there, and also an early look at the next year's fall meeting. So uh, if you want to participate in that, helping to shape the future FPA meetings, uh, you can do that through, uh, you know, attending these planning meetings. You can also help doing that if you submit uh, suggested topics on the FPA website. There's a link how you can uh, submit uh, topics that you feel like are important that we should talk about and should be looked at. If you submit it through the FPA website, it will get in the hopper and we will bring those up at the FPA planning meeting. So again, thank you everyone for their participation. And uh, from my end, that's it was great four days, a lot of information, and I have to sort of let that settle in and, and absorb what I heard. And back to you, Matt. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, very nice summary and recap. Just a couple of additional things. Uh, Matthias being the um, the gentleman that he is, uh, uh, did not include himself <laughs> among the list of people who were organizing this TEM, but uh, he clearly played as important a role as as any of us did. And, and uh, I know that he was in various and sundry parts of this wonderful country of ours on vacation, not on vacation, doing doing work in support of this TEM, and and I, I do appreciate your support, your support, Matthias, and your your wisdom in, in all that we do. For folks who are are curious, um, uh, our normal you know every six month rotation has us in the March April time frame for the spring FPA meeting, and then again in the October November time frame. I think uh, is the way it works out. For the fall um, FPA meeting next fall, and she's not here to defend herself, so I'll just assume that it is still true. Uh, I I am I believe that we have an invitation to meet in person next fall, provided of course that the world has returned to semi-normal conditions uh, at the National Severe Storms Lab out in Norman. Um, and we traditionally and typically hold our spring meetings in person in the DC area. And uh, I think it is safe to say that our thinking is that we will, again, if conditions permit, hold that spring meeting in the DC area somewhere, uh, whether it be the NTSB Auditorium, who has graciously allowed us to use their facility for many, many years, or um, perhaps uh, the, the ALPA facility in Tyson's Corner or the MITRE facility in McLean. So we, we have some 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 opportunities to choose to uh, among which to choose. So um, we will we will figure that out as we go forward. Again, Matthias talked about the 20th. That's a Wednesday, 1130 until we're done. Um, if you're interested in in shaping what is discussed in FPA in the coming months, this is really your opportunity to do so. Of course, if you do attend, that means you're subject to being uh, asked to to participate as a session lead or a session uh, presenter, but uh, it's a small price to pay. Um, I, I think that's all I have to uh, to say too. Um, and and Scott, uh, 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 your your comment about virtual, um, I personally um, believe firmly that we will be unable to not have a virtual aspect to our meetings going forward. So yes, we hear you. Um, anybody else have any last comments or thoughts? Bill Bauman, thank you very much for uh, for for doing today's session and for uh, uh, for listening to me at nine o'clock this morning say, here's what I think we should do and, and not not passing out. So that yeah, was great. I, I appreciate it. I thank you for saving the day. You really helped both you and me by getting involvement from everybody and uh, using this new tool. So this is pretty cool. Very good. Anybody else around the room? Going once, going twice, 
we'll call it a day. Bye, all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye.